Good morning. Good to see you here today. What a beautiful day it is that the Lord has made. And yeah, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Right, Francis? All right. Hey, I want to say hello to those of you who are streaming online today. I know it's been a while since I greeted you, but happy that you're joining us where you are. And I uh, just want to welcome all the guests and uh, uh, friends that we have here today. Just thank you for being here. And um, we're going to pick up today on where we were last time. So I, I have a little review of the, the uh, part one of this message. But ultimately, what we're talking about really has a lot to do with what we're celebrating this week, and that is Thanksgiving, to take a, a record and a look at all the things that God has blessed us with and the things that God has granted to us and to be thankful for them. And so last week, we began a, a series on God and money, and we asked this question in that, why does God give us money? Why does God bless us at all? Remember in the beginning, he made man in his image. He said, let them be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. That is, master it. Have dominion over it. So God created stuff and he gave us stuff. Remember even to Adam, he brought all the animals that he made to Adam and said, you name them. You have part with me in my stuff. And God has always wanted us to be heirs of his and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. As it says in Romans chapter 8, he made us to share life with him. And so the possessions he gives us have a lot to do with his heart, which is, as Jesus said, he didn't come to be served, but rather to serve. And the things that God gives us, the gifts, the possessions, the wealth, is all a part of using our power to do good. So believe it or not, last week we, we covered 15 principles of money. And so we're going to probably double up on that today. But it had to do, as we saw last week, with honoring God and not loving money, but loving God, worshiping God, and rather making money and possessions your servant. They're at your disposal, given to you by God for your use. And we talked about how it's important to be thankful and content with the things that God has given us, that we're not always looking for what we don't have, but we're grateful for what we do have, and looking to God as our provider, and making God our business partner. And one of the things we saw last week was that we don't work just to have for ourselves. In fact, the commandment that is given, which is the spirit of the law of thou shalt not steal, is given in Ephesians chapter 4, and in verse 28, where it says, let him who stole Steal no more, but rather let him work with his hands what is good that he may have something to give to someone else. We get up in the morning, we should be getting up, not just to provide for ourselves, but to provide for those who are our own, those who are around us, and to be able to share with others. It's a huge motivator and a why we get up to work, why we collect money, why we go about in, in this life with the resources and the things that God has instructed us in. In addition to that, we talked about how, what God says to those of us who do have money. And we talked about this in terms of what it is to be rich because when you look at our society, we are so rich, right? The kings of England and the pharaohs of Egypt would have loved to have the air conditioning that you have in your house. Believe me, they had slaves fanning them down, but you have air conditioning. You, you flip a switch and, and all of a sudden there's air conditioning or the car that you're spinning around in. They didn't have anything like that. Getting up in a plane, come on, there's, it's incredible what has happened in our society. And we take all these things for granted and we make comparisons of what wealth is versus you know, people that are like mega, mega, super wealthy when the reality is here we are in the United States, we are well past having just clothing and food. We are like way past that moment. And so realizing what God has given us and to be ready to share in, in using that worldly money to store up eternal treasure. Now, with that in mind, on point number 15, I'd like to begin this message asking you to turn with me, if you would, to uh, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 1 to 13. This is a parable that Jesus spoke in Luke 13, verses 1, where, uh, excuse me, Luke 16, Luke 16, verses 1 to 13. Luke 16, verse 1, he said to his disciples, this is Luke 16, verse 1, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him, saying, this man is wasting your goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking away 
uh, the stewardship from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I have resolved to do what uh, to uh, what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship that they might receive me into their houses. So here's his plan. He called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take the bill, sit down quickly and write 50. He said to another, how much uh, do you owe? And he said, oh, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generations than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, or when they fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. And mammon is money, possessions, the things of this world, the substance of this world. Now, this parable has caused a lot of confusion for people over time because they're saying, is Jesus saying that what you should do is when uh, you're in somebody's, uh, a steward for somebody that you should take from them? Is he saying that it was good that he was writing down the bills, that he was basically taking more money from his master and basically just writing down the bills to discount for everyone that owed? And, And the thing is, Jesus' point here is not to say, steal from your master. That's not it. But he is talking about the shrewdness of the use of goods under your care for what they do for a place when they fail. See, in the beginning there, he said in verse 1, there's a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. We talked about it last week that everything we have is a gift from God. God says the gold is mine, the silver is mine, money is mine. Everything you have, you got because God gave it to you. Even your very life and existence, the body that you're existing in right now is actually a gift from God. So everything that we have comes from God. Now, the difference between a worldview, you know, a worldly view and a God view, a biblical point of view, is you see yourself as being a possession of God's. You see that you're the creation, he's the creator. You're seeing that what you have were things that he made and he has shared with you in the bounty of it. And so where do all the fish of the sea come from? Where do all the little chickens come from and the cows and the things that we eat and the things that are used to clothe us? Where do all the vegetables and the seeds that produce and how does all this increase happen on earth? I mean, you realize we live in a planet that's producing wealth all the time. It's amazing, there's wealth all over this planet. Who made it? The, the biblical perspective is God made it, and it's all his. So what is our life here about? Well, a part of it is the stewardship that we have under God to take of the things that he has made. Again, remember in the beginning in Genesis, he said to mankind, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over basically everything that's on it and in it. Now, if you fast forward to the end of the book in Revelation, one of the prophecies of Jesus Christ coming at the seventh trumpet is that he will come to destroy those who destroy the earth. The very thing he gave us to be good stewards of, the very thing he put into our hands and said, use this for good, use the power and the wealth and the possessions that I'm giving you for good things. There is an accounting that God is bringing forth. And he's saying, if you... At the end here, verse 11, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who's going to commit to your trust the true riches? If you don't even know how to take care of what I've blessed you with, how am I going to be able to give you spiritual wealth? So realize that what is playing out here in the temporary is what we do in the spirit. 
there is a morality that we should find when we read God's word about how to manage the wealth and the resources he's given us and what the purpose is behind it. Do we spend it and waste it as this steward was charged with or are we using it for good things? Jesus' counsel was use this worldly mammon to create friendships with yourself that will last forever. In other words, what Jesus said, give to the poor and you will have riches in heavenly places where moth and rust do not corrupt. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Think about your life, not just in saying, I have this stuff, it's mine, but rather I've been giving it, given it by God for the giving and sharing with others. The mindset is you have been given power through the things that God has blessed you with, and now it is in your hand as a good steward under the Lord Jesus Christ to use the things that have been left in our hands for his purposes, for his kingdom, for his glory. So he says here in verse 10, or verse 9, so make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon that when they fail, they, that is the friends, may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in little, or excuse me, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. It plays out. If you're doing it in the little things, you can do it in the big things. If you're not doing it in the little things, then why would you think you could do it in the big things? Are you managing your money with this in mind? Are you using the things that God has blessed you with, with this thought behind it? And, and he is looking to see how we manage what we have. So he says, if you haven't been faithful, how are you going to receive the true riches? He who is faithful in least will be faithful in much. Now, notice what it says here as well in Proverbs 21, 17. He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Now, when we read this parable in Luke chapter uh, 16, it doesn't say how the steward was wasting his master's goods. What the parable is saying is, there was a rich one who gave his steward charge over his possessions, and he was squandering. Now, if you and I view our lives as being creations of God, that we are being brought into the family of God by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that we would be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, that we would be disciples, then the question we have to ask is, how are we using the things that have been entrusted to us at this time? no matter how little or how great they may be in anyone's estimation. What are we doing with our time? What are we doing with our resources? What are we doing with our possessions and our money? These are things that are important to think about, and there's principles that God gives us in the Bible. And he basically says that he who loves pleasure will be a poor, poor man because there's so many things to chase after. You love wine and oil. You love Starbucks, maybe, right? Right? There's all kinds of things that can get in the way of thinking about what stewardship is. But stewardship actually requires a vision of what things will be, not just where things are today. And that's an important part of understanding the philosophy of life because when it comes to managing money and managing the things that God has given us, it isn't just about consumption for the self. In fact, that would be pursuing the wrong thing. But it is also about how to work to, for what is good in order to give and share with somebody else. Do we think about this in terms of the way that we go about handling our possessions? And are we driven by the things of this earth? Because this is what causes so much financial heartache in our world today. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but happy is he who keeps the law. If you get your money and spend it on everything that your heart desires, it doesn't matter if you make $100 a week, $500 a week, $1,000, $10,000, it'll all go away. And I've personally witnessed this in my life. And, and those, those, those people around me that I've had associations with, it was always, well, if I got more money, I, could, I would get on a budget. If I got more money, I would live more wisely. Got more money, 
didn't necessarily mean that. I know a person who, in my experience of walking with them for about 10 years, started with a $300 salary, and at the end of that, uh, was making $400,000 a year, which was, is, you know, about, what, $8,000 a week. $300 to $8,000. Great at gathering money. You'd have to say, smart to earn it. But when he had 300, he was in debt. When he was doing 400,000 a year, he was in debt, and he was actually in more debt than he was when he only made $300. He just went broke at a higher level. And that's the thing. The, the things of little to the things of much play out in life. If you blow all your money at 300, chances are you're going to blow it all at uh, 8,000. Because there's a principle that guides this. We need to understand that we can't be putting off the reality of where we are today and saying, God, help me to manage where I am now. And we do that by making our request known to God with thanksgiving. It comes from a contentment from where we are today. If you're at the 300, be thankful where you are today. And then remember that you're in California. It's a $15 minimum wage, so you'd be at 600 to start. So see, you double your money right away in this scenario. <laughs> you have to be thankful and content where you are. And you need to view what comes into you as God's stuff, and now you're the steward of that. Remember last week, we, he said, command the rich, enjoy what I give you, but also, he made four statements but be ready to give, willing to share, right, out of your heart. This, this is the philosophy. And we need to remember that God has put things into our hands for us to share. But if our desire is driven by what we want in life, then what we will find is that we'll be poor both physically and spiritually. See, the more money when all you want is oil and pleasure will actually make you really empty inside because you'll be spending money looking for what will make you happy. You'll be buying stuff thinking that that will satisfy and all it does is create a deeper emptiness inside and a deeper poverty of spirit. That's the thing that God wants us to see. See, sometimes we can think that a love of money is only to those who have a lot of it. Actually, I find that the deeper love of money is in those who don't have it because the desire is constantly pursuing money more. I need this. I want this. If only I had this. If I could have more money, if I could get, win the lottery, win the big contract, win this, then there would be satisfaction. And the reality is that's all a lie. The true riches of life are only found in Christ Jesus. It is finding a satisfaction in God when we can say, you are my portion. My life is in you. Whether I have it or not, I'm content. As the Apostle Paul said, we read last week, he said, whether I'm abased or abounding, I find myself to be content. Why? Because he knew what the true riches of life were all about. And he found his life in Christ this life is but just a vapor of time. And we need to remember that God is testing mankind. And as he tests mankind, what we do with our possessions is a big part of that. So just remember that one who is driven by a love of pleasure will be poor both physically and spiritually. It's a truth throughout the scriptures that we see. Romans 13, 8 says it like this. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. He who loves one another has fulfilled the law. So as you look at the law and say, I want to keep the law, then what you do is focus on love. And that is the way we manage our money. Why do we manage the money the way and the things that God gives us? He wants us to use it for love, for the taking care of us and receiving of his love and using those gifts with others. He wants that to be driving our collecting of, and our use of wealth in our lives. So if we understand these principles, it can help us think about what we need to do as we start to collect and as we start to receive. So I just want you to think about this. To owe no one anything and also to do good. We talked about giving God a tenth last week. We talked about giving to the poor and the needy. To do that, to give... Uh, to not owe anyone anything, to do good to God and others with our money requires living on less than you earn. 
Now, why is that such a big point? Live on less than you earn. A study just came out, just came out, was published just this last week. 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 60%. And so when you live on all that you have, then with how are you going to stay out of debt? When something goes wrong, when, when you want that next Starbucks, that next oil, that next wine, I got to have this, I got to have that, I'm doing the trip to Jamaica, I'm going to go out for the weekend to Mexico, where do you put it? Then you go back into owing somebody something. So now what you're doing is you're borrowing money, you're putting it in a spot because if you're living paycheck to paycheck, there is no room. And here's the crunch that's happening in our society right now. We basically had a 40-year bull run on interest rates. When I was a kid, interest rates were really high, like 14 15%. And what has happened since that time in the, uh, the 70s in, is basically they just kept dropping down. And now we got down to where in 2020, those 15% interest rates were down to 0.55 was the bottom on the 10-year treasury bills. Basically, it, money got to be free. It got so cheap. And, and there's been so much planning off the cheap. So what happens now as interest rates go back up? Everything's going back up. And we have inflation and rising interest rates. Two things that tax you whether you know it or not. Rising interest rates and taxation. So now what's happening is it costs more to get gas. It costs more to get food. It costs more for the normal things of life that people build their life around living paycheck to paycheck. There was no preparation that what was going to happen at some point was it, there was going to be a, a bump in the road. Things were going to get more expensive. Now, where are you? And that is where people find themselves, and that's what this study talked about. People are kind of in a crunch right now. Because when 60% are living paycheck to paycheck and everything is more expensive, that means people are now putting on debt. We had the highest single uh, month of increases in consumer debt put on credit cards in the history of the United States. Because what do you do? Well, I'm not cutting my lifestyle. I love riches. I love pleasure. I love wine and oil. So let's just put it on the credit card. Credit cards... They just hit an average, the average credit card as of uh, this last week, 19%. 19%. It's gone up really fast. Mortgages are over 7%. And I just talked to somebody today, said, looks like we're going to be over 8% after the first of the year with, with more interest rates coming. So where the mortgages were down at a point, now they're at eight points. It changes what people can do, and it changes life significantly. And if people didn't lock in their rates and they're on variable mortgages, they're going to feel a lot of pain when that comes due because people stretch to get into the nicer home, and then your Waterloo moment comes because interest rates rise, and now you're in trouble. I mean, really, it wasn't that long ago. Interest rates were still at 5 6%. I mean, earlier this year, you're looking at 8% rates coming next year. It impacts. So you have to learn this lesson. You've got to live on less than you earn. If you're living on everything you're taking in, you're not thinking as a steward needs to think about money. Because what you're doing is saying, I've got all this now. Remember the cartoon? Uh, maybe I'm probably really dating myself. When I was a little kid, there was a cartoon. I think I watched the thing like 100 times. It was the grasshopper and the ant. You saw that, Linda? Okay, you make me feel special now. So we're in an age group together. We share that moment. So the, the point was the ant was busy about his business collecting because what did the ant think about? Winter. In summer, you got to think winter. When you're harvesting, you got to think about when you can't harvest. Living paycheck to paycheck is saying, I never think winter's coming. It's like you're denying seasons of life that come along that change things. There are things that happen. You get in an accident, all of a sudden you have medical bills. Well, I wasn't prepared for that. I was living paycheck to paycheck. Exactly. You, you had no buffer in your life. 
So just because something comes into your hand doesn't mean that you should be spending it all. And you think this way at the beginning, hopefully, and it will carry you on. But if you've gone through life not doing this, then you have to say, how do I get back and adjust? We're going to talk about that more, God willing, the next time I speak on the subject. We're going to get into more application. But we need to at least understand the biblical principles of this in order to understand the principle is if, if you're going to give God a tithe, if you're going to be giving to those who have need, that means that you don't get to spend it all on yourself. God never gave you all the things he gave you thinking it would just be for you to consume it on yourself. He meant you to be a steward. He's watching how you use the ungodly mammon because if you can't manage the ungodly mammon, why would he give you the true riches? If you're spending all for what you want and not thinking about having in order to share, to protect, to help, you're not thinking about life the right way. And this is really deep. And the reason we have financial issues is because the philosophy of life has become a love of self more than a love of God. God is not the focus of it. And we try to remove God. That's like we have this faith in God and then we don't think that money's a part of it. No, it's a big part of it. And actually, we went through over 60 verses last week. We'll go through over 50 today. And we got lots more to go because there is so much that God says about this subject and sometimes we don't associate that God should be everything in this part of our everything as well. Proverbs 22, verse 7 says this, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So we talked about the interest rates. Do you see how that works? If you have a credit card right now, and you put $1,000 on your credit card for something that is a consumable Suddenly, somebody who's rich that had money to pay that 1000 for you is now asking for, on average, 19% back. What's 19%? $190 a year. Now, the credit cards are kind of designed to keep you paying the minimum to keep the balances. Why? Because they keep receiving money from you. That's how you make yourself a servant. And do you just get out of that? There's consequences to get out of debt. Bankruptcies. Things can happen to people that put you into bankruptcy, and now it becomes difficult to do much until that bankruptcy expires. You're putting yourself in a position where now you owe somebody something more than love. Now, people will ask me a lot of times about, does this include like houses or equipment I need for a business or something like that? Just, just remember this. When you owe somebody, that means it's what you have that you owe that person is due. But when you put it on a house, if you have equity in the house, you don't actually owe. It's just that you're in business with that person. The equity of the house does it. So think of your net worth like this. If you have credit card debt and there's no asset behind it except you paying it, that's what you owe. Because the only one that's going to pay that is you. If in California you have a house that's worth $500,000 and you owe $400,000, you actually have $100,000 in that home. The way to get that is you would liquidate it. The bank would take their four hundred, dollars you would get your one hundred. dollars It's actually an asset. It's the difference between an asset in property and an asset in liquid cash. So just remember when you think about that, what you owe is what you're secured, securing by your own work, by your own ability to give the dollars back. You have a piece of equipment or a home or property, something that is of value that can be sold, then what that is is based on how much you can get for that thing. That thing is the asset. So there's cash assets, there's hard assets. You can transfer them back and forth. So even though you might have a mortgage on something, you still actually own that as long as you have equity in your property. All right? So you come into those situations where you have this, but that power that people are losing to credit card companies and the average credit card, we'll, we'll talk about that. I'm going to save that for, for next time. Let's keep moving on here. So here's, here's the principle. It costs too much to live poor. It costs too much to live poor. 
Think about it. If, if, if you end up putting $10,000 of expenditures on a credit card in a year, and you're just paying the minimum and paying on the balance of that 19% on average, 10,000 means you just spent 1,900 for the privilege of using somebody else's money that year. When you're wealthy and you have the money in advance of what your purchase is, you just pay the 10,000. You don't pay 11,900. So every time that you're taking money from somebody else, not only do they get the power, not only do they make the profit, but you're actually paying more for life. You want to pay as little to others as you can, and you want to lend your money out for the increase that you can receive in a bank or in an investment or somewhere else. Or Jesus even said, you know, you should have at least put your money at the bank. But you got to have money to put at the bank. When he gives of the possessions, he's looking, how do we use the possessions? So when he gave the talents, talents were a large sum of money that Jesus gave in that parable. He's saying, how did you use the talent I gave you? How did you use those things. And of course, it's not just about money, but it's about all the things that God gives us. So remember this thought that when you live life using other people's money, you pay more than they do. That everything costs you more when you put it on a credit card. And you're signing up for that when you do it. So my job here is to show you this is the truth. It costs you more to do it. You get to choose. So you have to have something to share in order to give to another. Again, living on less means I'm not just thinking of how I want to use it, but am I storing up things that now I'm available to give, right? When you think of Boaz in his fields, and here he is harvesting, and he's leaving behind for Naomi, the whole concept of the thought in that beautiful romantic story is, I want to take good care of her. He had extra. He had what he could leave for her. When God said, you're planting in the field, what did he say? Don't harvest the corners. Leave it for the poor. Leave it for the widow, the orphan, the stranger. He said, when you go over your boughs and your branches and your vineyard, don't go over it a second time. Let the remnant be for them. God was always thinking in these terms that part of the way we are working together with God, when we plant, when we water, when he causes the increase and the sunshine, all of these things of working together with God was with the thought that it's not just about us, it's for other people too. It's so beautiful when we see God's ways and the way that he wants to do that. So he wants to bless us in order to give to another. And that's why, as we talked about last week, so important to make God our business partner. Now, our money and our possessions, one way to look at them is they are stored labor. Sometimes we forget. We think it's just about the money, but that money costs something in labor. It costs something in intelligence. It costs something in effort that was put forward to get you a unit of wealth that you can now take and use. Now, this is an important concept because the gathering of wealth is something that God has wanted us to do, and working is a part of development of our soul. A lot of times we look at the fourth commandment, and we look at, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But that's not the whole commandment. God didn't give a commandment that only affects one-seventh of our time. For the other six-sevenths, he said, six days you shall work and do all your labor. So, the part of work is very important because God made us to be productive. In order to fill the earth and subdue it means there has to be labor. The very first thing when he put Adam in the garden, or when he uh, talked, put Adam in the garden in Genesis 2, he said, tend and keep. I'm putting you here in this beautiful garden. Now I want you to take care of it. Isn't that amazing how that happens? You grow up wanting your own house, and you're like, man, I just gave myself a ginormous chore. It's like, wow, the gift that keeps giving, right? Because the more you have, the more you have responsibility. The more it requires of you to tend and keep. Sometimes people want more and more stuff. It's like I have friends that have yachts and, and boats and stuff that I work with. They're like, Dave, you need to get a boat. I'm like, absolutely not. I got no time for a boat. So I would be taking care of the boat, and then I'd feel guilty, which a lot of those guys do. They're like, well, I feel like I need to use my boat since I spent so much on it. That's right. 
Just because you have more money and more stuff doesn't put you in a better position in life. You might just end up being a slave to all your money and all your possessions if those things take up your life and you have no room left for God and others. So think about the balance of, of these things. But God wants us to be uh, working. And again, I, I didn't say the quote there. Exodus 20, verse 9, Deuteronomy verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 13. It's the same phrase. Six days you shall work and do all your labor. So God made us to be productive, to be fruitful, to have dominion, to love God first and, enemy, or, and our neighbor as ourselves. And our enemies as ourselves too, actually. Proverbs 24, 27. Prepare your outside work. Make it fit for yourself in the field. Afterward, build your house. Really key principle here that God gives us about the creation of wealth and working and how to go about it in order. You, you don't build for yourself in your home and where you are first. The first thing you have to do is work on the income side of things. Working to generate, asking God to be your business partner, asking God for the help so that you go out to work and that he provides the increase. You see, you need to be thinking about that first in life. That comes before the boat. That comes before the house. That comes before the stuff. Because you shouldn't be spending more according to God's way than what he's giving you. In other words, God will work with you to bless you according to the work of your hands. He wants to be blessing you, but that's what you have. And with that being content, now you can say, how much am I giving to God? How much am I giving to neighbor? How much am I going to give toward a home and toward my food and toward my clothing? And having a thought like a steward. I think one of the truths of life is that there has been so little focus about God and money in our schools in our families, in our education, that we don't see this as part of what God wants us to be doing. It's actually throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God gives to us to see what we will be as stewards if we will take and use of the things that he's given us for his glory. And yes, as we spoke about last week in Ecclesiastes and also in 1 Timothy 6, he wants you to enjoy it. This isn't about an ascetic life, but it's about being a steward of what goes to God, what goes to others, and what we consume for ourselves. So prepare your outside work first. So first, work to create your increase, and then you use of that increase to build. Physically or spiritually, we must gather first in order to give. If you haven't received of the gospel of Jesus Christ and know the healing that his grace brings, how can you share that riches with somebody else? In other words, we receive of his riches, and having known of these riches, we can now share these riches. And the same is true physically. We take of what he gives us in order that we can give to others. So we work with God. We do not work on our own for our own consumption. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 4 to 5, it says, He who has a slack hand will become poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. Now, these verses refer, obviously, to the agricultural climate of what society was. In fact, if you go back to the like 1900 and before, basically the world was a bunch of farmers, that's the way it was. In the United States, 90% of all people acknowledged that they were uh, agrarian lifestyle. That was what they put down as their profession when they did the census in 1900. 90% basically were farm families. People had land. They had animals. They grew crops. They did this. That life is so different to the way life is today. The paycheck life is very, very different, right? So even the concepts of what God is talking about wanting us to do take a thought that we might not get in the translation. Because if we're thinking, well, we harvest every week, we get that paycheck every week or every two weeks or 15th and 30th a month or whatever it might be, we're looking for something that we keep taking in. And God is saying, what I'm talking about is you need to be harvesting now, thinking about what is coming when you can't. And we miss that lesson 
and we don't prepare for the future, and we don't prepare for the rainy day, and we don't prepare for losing our jobs for six months, we don't prepare for what things might happen because we, we are living paycheck to paycheck, 60% of us. So what we want to look at is this concept. Making God your business partner is so important in an agrarian society. When you plant potatoes in the spring, they get ready in the fall. And what is so cool about potatoes is that the plants grow, but if you dig up the plant two months in, three months in, do you know what you see under there? No potatoes, just the roots of the plant. The potatoes actually really burst forward at the very end. Because what you have is as the plant starts to die, it pushes its energy into the roots, and now you start to get the potatoes. And the effects of the weather and the growing patterns of that uh, product is, is all going to factor how many big, large potatoes. This year, we didn't get a lot of big potatoes out of Idaho. Say, Dusty knows that. Right, Dusty? You love having potato conversations, don't you? Oh, yeah. Because the big potatoes at the, you know, the steakhouses want the big potato. Those potatoes don't exist. Everything is smaller this year. So when you're growing potatoes and you realize that how many I get is based on the increase God gives me, how big they are is based on the increase that God gives me, and that when I harvest them, I've got to make them last the whole year. Did you know that? If you go eat an Idaho baked potato in June, that was an Idaho potato that was harvested the previous September. They put them into cold storage. They control it basically like the old root cellar, but in these massive, like three football field size sheds up in Idaho, and they're preserving potatoes at temperature for a, a year. They got to make it go a whole year because that's what we demand as a society. We want the potatoes to last. So when you're involved in that kind of business and you know that the wealth that you get for the whole year is based on that, God being your business partner is a lot more important. And sometimes we miss that lesson in society because we have become servants for corporations and we've become a, a, an economy that is based on services and not agreeing ways. And I'm not saying that's a right or wrong thing. There's been services all the time. Jesus himself uh, looks like was a carpenter or some kind of worker. There's service businesses that have always been around. But the reality is that the wealth of society still comes up from the ground. That's really where all wealth comes from. The gold, the silver, the oil, all the food that we eat, all the things that we use to clothe us. Basically, it's just stuff that comes from the earth. God provides the increase, and then we develop our economic systems on top of that. So, God, being engaged in our lives and, and seeing all of this working as something we do together is so important. My family, uh, growing up, they were farmers. Grew up in Illinois, and my family was in basically Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa, and they grew corn, uh, soybeans. What you learn as well is they expect to have one good year basically out of every five. And then they can have one to three okay years, and then the others can be kind of bad. And they have to plan. They have to think that way. So the way they harvest, when they sell, it's not just a matter of having it, but it's a matter of thinking about it strategically when they get those bumper crops, how and when they're going to sell it, because really it's the bumper crop that makes their wealth, and they get one chance every five years to make that happen. That's really where they make their money. The other money is basically just keeping them going. It's a tough business. It's a tough way to live, but when you do that, you realize, I need your help, God, to order to have the wisdom and the mastery to subdue the land and to think in a way that will bring blessing. So it's not just a matter of having the money, it's a matter of what you do with the money as well. There's a diligence in this. A slack hand brings poverty, 
uh, poverty, but diligence brings wealth. And the truth is that largely we get the freedom to choose. We get the freedom to choose this. Sometimes we don't like to think about that, but that is a big law in the scripture. In a free society, I say in a free because if you're in a slave society or in something where there's, there's limitations on income or work or development or moving up where they say you're only going to ever be this, that changes the game a lot. But you as a person that God made living on this earth have the opportunity to do this based on the gifts and the things that God gives you based on ingenuity and wealth. And we know that because we read these stories all the time. You can use the wisdom that God has given to increase your wealth. Notice what it says here in Proverbs 6, 6 to 11. The ant is one of the stars of the sermon today. And as we've already talked about the ant and, and the grasshopper. Oh, I never finished that story. So the ant, did I? No. So the ant gathers knowing what? Winter's coming. The grasshopper just keeps eating what, what is available. And so the grasshopper ends up with no food in the winter time. So, Sorry. Started you on something, never finished. My bad. Proverbs 6, 6 to 11. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. In other words, what makes the ant someone to look to is, first of all, you don't have to tell that ant what to do. That ant doesn't need to be directed. That ant directs itself to do the gathering, knowing that they need to gather in the summer, in the harvest, for the winter that's to come. So if this is the wisdom that God is talking about, and this is the diligence and work, I want you to notice that, yes, a part of it is getting out there and doing it, but the other part is an anticipation and a thinking that I've got to do this now for what's coming. I have to be thinking ahead. I have to be gathering up for what is yet to be. So the questions might be, in what ways are we providing supplies in the summer and gathering? That's the first part of this that we can learn of the wisdom of the ant. The next is the way... God, God's way requires us to manage ourselves and our possessions. Did you ever have anybody tell you that? Like growing up that you have to manage your own money? It seems funny to me, but I, I made it into, I, I always managed my money, even as a kid. My mom was pretty good with budgeting and telling me how to, how to do things. And I, I liked her instruction, and it went well for me. But I didn't really think about the whole, like, what happens in the future thing. I, I, you know, in my, in, when you're a teenager, you're not thinking about being 65. But if you live to be 65, you wish that when you were a teenager, you would have thought about that a little bit, right? It's like having conversations with yourself. You need to have a conversation with yourself at 65. And if you're 65, what, what do you do at this point, George? J just keep talking to yourself today. So it's, you, it's, you, 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 you get to a point, though, but... What, how did you get to the point where you have it when you're 86? You did something with it earlier in life, right? You thought about it. You had these conversations with yourself. So young people, talk to yourself as an older person. What would the older person of you want? You have the ability to have a conversation in wisdom to say, where are we heading? Because if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you're not thinking about your, the older version of you. And wisdom is gathering in the harvest, which is your younger working years, to lay something forward for the winter years. If God so blesses you with long life, I assure you, you're going to work and want to work harder when you're younger than when you're older. Right? It becomes harder to move around. I, I'm in my 50s. It's harder to move around now. And I don't... I don't even know where that's going, but it's harder. <laughs> so financial wisdom is not just about gathering money, but knowing what to do when you have it. So the point is investing a portion of everything you earn. If you're not investing a portion of everything you're earning as you're working toward 
older ages in life, you're not thinking about that person. And the fact that gathering might be a lot tougher in your 80s than it is in your 40s. So you invest a portion of everything you earn. This is the whole concept that's found in the book, The Richest Man in Babylon, which basically says you got to pay yourself. We pay, we pay our electric bill, we pay the gas bill, we pay the mortgage bill, pay the car bill, the insurance bills, but do you pay you? Have you thought of paying you for the future and what, what lies ahead in life? So, so just take a little moment to reflect on the ant. No one needs to tell the ant what to do. That's where God wants you and me, being stewards of our own money. Ants working diligently. We work when we can to gather. Ants gather not just to eat now, but also later when it's hard to gather. That's how we should be investing and, and looking forward to the future. And ants have what they need because they were wise when they had the opportunity to be. And that's why God says, think about it. If we're not doing the things that God is teaching us in the Proverbs, then we need to rethink because he said, come on, sluggards. You're supposed to be doing this work. A lot of people don't mind going and getting a job and, and, and doing the work and having the money to pay the bills now. I find that most of the money laziness actually happens in the management of it once you have it and not wanting to think about investing and saying, it's too confusing. Well, there's a lot of ways that you can make it more simple, but, but we can't refuse to think because good stewardship in life is about thinking, and that is part of the point of what God is making. I want you to think. I want you to steward. I want you to manage. I want you to see that I've given you things to manage. Oh, let's go back to uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. 2 Thessalonians 3, Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, where it says, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which you have received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but our busybodies. Now so, those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and they eat their own bread. God wants us to be working. God wants us to be setting forth the example. God wants us to be showing what it is to work and to be encouraging of others. And God wants us to be productive in what we're doing and the way that we're managing our money and the way that we're managing our time. How are we managing our lives? And that is the essence of, of what God wants us to see here, that we are commanded, if anyone would not work, neither should he eat. It's kind of amazing when you, when you start learning more. I didn't know this till just recently, but in studying about the sects of Orthodox Jews in, in Israel, they're so holy, they don't work. They send their wives out to get the money, and they only spend their time studying. I had no idea that that was part of the culture in Israel and that they don't have to pay taxes because all they need to do is study. But they send their wives out to do the working for the family and, and, and they, they don't see themselves as working. I find it incredible that you could be a studier of the scriptures and going through the, the scriptures about the Sabbath day and working six days and you could go through Proverbs and not see that if you were a man of God, you would be working. That's part of what God wants us to be doing. And so he says, we command and exhort that you work in quietness and eat your old bread. So I love that Paul set this example. And this was when, when I was being called into ministry 
25 years ago, this was my prayer that God would provide for me so that it, it could be something I continued to do both to work and to be able to serve so that I wouldn't have to live off of anybody else's money. I think that we have found in the United States of America that putting money and ministry together is not a very good thing because what happens is the asks just keep coming. The money keeps being desired. And what you find then is rather than seeing it as a means to good, it becomes a means of wealth increasement for ministries. And then the way that that money is gained is by saying, well, you need to give so that you can get too. And uh, it's just a philosophy that is all over the church in the wealth gospel, which is give to get. If there's anything I hope you've seen in the sermon that I gave last week and the one we're giving here again, that's not the philosophy. That's not the approach. But you can actually manipulate God's laws to make it happen. It's the inverse of the love. It's based on selfishness, wanting to get rather than wanting to give. 1 Timothy 5.8 says that if anyone does not provide for his own and especially those of, the house, of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Did you know that this was in the Bible, that this is a scripture? He who does not work to provide for his own household has denied the faith. That's why I said the, the, the thing about the Orthodox Jews having a philosophy that literally is against us. Maybe it started back then and maybe that's what Paul's addressing. Because he said, it seems like there's a lot of people who don't want to work here. They just want to study, but they don't want to work. And he's saying, he who does not work shall not eat, and he who doesn't provide for his household has denied the faith. So, but it, it seems to be a tradition that carries on to, to this day in Israel. All right. I think that's a good point for us to break on this uh, for today. I thought I'd get a little further than I did, but I hope that you can see and, and think about life on this earth and the things that God has given you as blessings that come from him for you to use to his honor and to his glory. And that as you celebrate Thanksgiving this week, that you would take an accounting in your own life of the things that God has given you uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. And that you would take the time to just give him great thanks and great praise for everything he's put into our hands and the life that we have on this earth. It is all a gift from God. Let's pray. Father, we give you glory and honor. We give you praise for all the things that you have done and that from the very beginning, you wanted to bestow possessions and wealth and property. You gave us life, liberty, property right in the very beginning when you created us. And we thank you, God, for what you have given. And God, we do desire your wisdom we desire to know the principles that we would not be violating your law while yet asking for your blessing. We ask that the things that we are learning and as hopefully we can continue to learn about the subject of managing our possessions and, and money, that God, that you would just show us your heart and ways in it and that you would teach us of your wisdom that we might walk in paths with you and think your higher thoughts that are so much greater than our own but that you've been willing to share throughout your word. Bless your word in us, Father, and help us to think and be like you. In Jesus' holy name, amen.